On May 14th, we are going to see general elections being held in Turkey for the post of president and for parliament. Elections which are among the most significant in the world. Turkey is an important power. The positions, it's, the positions it takes are crucial for not only West Asia but for the entire world. And this election is particularly interesting as it has been very close. President Rajab Tayyip Erdogan, who has been in power in various ways since 2003, facing a very strong challenge. Uh, it's very unclear as of now what will happen polls saying polls giving different kinds of results but we today we wanted to look at not only Erdogan's record the kind of challenge he's facing in the elections but also the perspective of left and progressive forces in Turkey as well who played a long who had many struggles who played a vital role in the country's politics we are joined by Anil from the Turkish Communist Party from its central committee thank you so much for speaking to us thank you Prashant so I saw, wanted to start with the immediate issue, that of the general elections. Many people are observers, the media are calling it maybe the closest in recent times. And like I said, the polling indicates the leading candidates neck to neck. But maybe for, could you first take us through why uh, this election is so tight, so to speak, and how, why has Erdogan become so unpopular? Why is it so close? It's complicated because uh, Erdogan and the alliance of his party uh, facing an interesting dilemma. You can call it a challenge, of course, uh, but I think uh, we can find an answer to your question if you don't dive into this dilemma. Um, because uh, the election uh, is the closest one today, as you said, uh, but we must know that uh, Erdogan is kind of a personification of this dilemma. So, uh, I want to explain uh, a little bit more about this dilemma. Um, on the one hand, Erdogan suffered a series of defeats in the past. I'll get to that moment in a moment. Uh, but what I mean by defeat is in both sense, in uh, world view and in support of Turkish society. In other words, he seemed lost in terms of his legitimacy. Uh, actually, we must know that he is a politician of Islamist school, so-called uh, national vision movement in our country. Uh, and he trained as a fundamentalist and sworn anti-communist. Uh, he commonly regarded as liberal Islamist in the past, uh, or put it differently, a moderate Islamist. But his political school has never changed. Uh, he has always been a counter-revolutionist, uh, a fundamentalist, and the enemy of the Turkey's Republican laicist codes. So his and his party's main objective was to transform Turkey uh, using their Islamist agenda. They knew that they couldn't do that if they do not change their costume or clothes. Yes, they used liberalism as a weapon to earn trust of the big bosses of the Turkish capitalism, uh, the monopolies, uh, but the market ideology, liberalism, uh, privatization, corporate worldview were always their testaments, as it were. So, uh, eventually, they hit the wall in the past. I think uh, we can determine three major turning points in here, why they hit the wall. First, in Syria. So we saw a huge war, maybe the uh, world war in Syria. But in Syria, uh, they promised so much for their Islamist, Ottomanist, uh, imperial hunger. But they failed at least in the most part. Their Ottomanist project uh, was one of the few main cores of the counter-revolutionist agenda of their own. And the failure backlashed uh, as a legitimacy problem. So this was the first reason. Uh, and the second one, Turkish people were stubborn. Uh, we pour into the streets in the so-called June days, uh, and it was 2013, 10 years before. And it was one of the most important events in the Turkey's history. 
So political left made its presence on the streets uh, back then and most and the most important squares of the cities for example Istanbul, Ankara, Adana, Izmir uh, and republican laicist anti-imperialist cults were alive on those crowds in the end uh, June days cracked the second pillar of the Erdogan's Islamist agenda. Um, so there is one more. Uh, and the third one was the uh, latest earthquake disaster. Uh, it was a terrible disaster. But uh, yeah, it's probably the most tragic and devastating event in the Turkish history, I should say. Maybe a, a massacre, to put it on other words. Uh, and it meant uh, a fatal legitimacy crisis in the government and in the state also. They emptied their conservatism uh, using their own hands. Uh, people were awakened. Turkish people, even who support Erdogan before or his alliance, uh, which consists of nationalists and Islamists, suddenly and gradually realized that they lost all the credits in terms of ethics, faith, and even modesty in politics, etc. So Erdogan was naked back then, on those days, uh, as he and his party is all about money, profit, rent, and show business. So this could have been the Erdogan real closest moment until this moment. But in fact, uh, he could have been a political corpse, as I can say, as it were. But uh, here is the dilemma. So every time he lost his legitimacy, uh, every time he lost his confidence or confidence of his own supporters, the political system uh, come to the aid of him. The two alliance system, I mean, uh, or in practice, two party system had him uh, so much. So he somehow uh, find a way and, and use the system's soft spots to replenish his legitimacy. I mean, he, he uses politics to cover his failed ideology in a way. Uh, it's a phenomenon. Uh, and simply because of this mechanism of Turkish politics, this dilemma we are still talking about, uh, as it were one man, uh, and or his voting rate, or his uh, or this election's uncertainty. This is the dilemma we are facing. And back to the question, uh, because of this absurdity, uh, and for a long time, Erdogan's challenge also becomes our challenge. Right. Uh, that's the thing we are facing today. Basically, that's a very interesting uh, way you put it because you talked about the various aspects that have really hit him, but also why he seems to come back every time. But I think this time also uh, for <clears throat> me, people outside, it's been an uh, interesting occasion. Also interesting in bad ways as well because the sheer extent of the economic crisis in Turkey. We've been reading reports of the massive inflation that people are facing, the currency losing value. All this happened last year, of course. We have heard, uh, you know, uh, workers take to the streets, uh, protests taking place on the issue of wages. And finally, Erdogan responding, the government responding by increasing wages at the last moment. Minimum wages, I believe, at the very last moment. But could you maybe take us to the extent of the economic crisis and also the kind of policies you mentioned, the market policies, the neoliberalism, as they say. But could you maybe take us a bit in depth into those policies which have led to this crisis? Yeah, first of all, uh, nothing starts before the election, I must say. Uh, if you want to understand economic crisis in Turkey, uh, we definitely look at the beginning of all. I think that's necessary to understand what's going on, going, going to happen after the election, after the election. Uh, begin, beginning with the term crisis, uh, technically speaking, Turkish economy is not facing a real breakdown, uh, in technically speaking. Uh, capitalist machinery, economic order is running well. Uh, both AKP, Erdogan, and the opposition are not going to change any structural uh, policies of the Turkish economy. 
I mean, Turkish capitalism is benefiting from being close to the Europe. It's ties to the European capital and being a bridge over Russia, Asia and Africa. Uh, the Turkish industry is developed uh, in close relation to the European markets. Uh, think that as an export hub or logistic hub of this region. Uh, this goes as planned before. Nothing's changed and changing. But Turkish economy is not like uh, or is not like German economy, for example. Uh, its ability to absorb shocks, fluctuations, uh, is not comparable to so-called great economies or central imperialists. Also, the Turkish economy is in the middle of a bottleneck in terms in terms of finance and economy. Uh, I mean, managing funds as the main source of economic growth uh, because it's not easy to find sustained uh, fun, funds to keep economic economy growing in Turkey. Basically, Turkish capitalism is facing facing its limits and want to go beyond those limits. That's a tough question, uh, because that's also a question of profitability uh, for the capitalist side. And this means either you cut the profits or cut the wages. There are just two options. And of course, Erdogan government cannot cut the big bosses' profits. Uh, they depend uh, on them. However, Erdogan government also adds some parameters to this problem. Uh, all of us call this problem as election economy in here. Uh, but actually, it's a deep-rooted problem in Turkish economy. I want to back to the legitimate problem, uh, but uh, Erdogan government uh, instinctively or reasonably finds a way out of this problem, I must say. Uh, first of all, they, they wanted to keep economy growing and hold down the unemployment. They printed money, they increased wages to keep economy of legitimacy in the, the so-called boundaries. Uh, we have a saying in here, uh, two things bring the government down, uh, empty pot uh, and unemployment. So do they manage? Uh, the economy or this crisis. I must say nothing mysterious here. Uh, they just using the time as a leverage point. So they postpone the hard burdens of the economic uh, policy of the years uh, that has passed. In the meantime, uh, they use inflation as a leverage too. Uh, likewise, to increase profits using inflation uh, that makes big bosses very happy, actually, uh, very, very happy. Also, th this gives them a gift at two points. Uh, actually, the bosses only discomfort is uh, that the Erdogan government may not control this so-called economic stick uh, during these years. And the opposition's only economic alternative is that they say we can control better. We can use this stick better. I can say it uh, for the trade union side uh, that uh, trade unions fight this policy as it should be uh, because of series of reasons. Uh, but workers, laborers, especially some new and lively sections of the working class uh, find new waves of struggle. Uh, we saw that uh, the past two years. Such as delivery workers, uh, find and gained uh, their rights several times during the past years. Uh, that was an important spark for the whole class in Turkey uh, and even for the larger crafts to fight against government policies. Um, I guess basically uh, your questions, uh, the answer of your questions is like this. Absolutely. Uh, also now moving to uh, another issue that has often been discussed, which is really about the political structures and institutions in the country. Now, we know that uh, one allegation often leveled against Erdogan and his system is that they have really centralized uh, power, you know, completely shifting the way Turkish politics is done, uh, democratic institutions 
facing a huge amount of threat. At least whatever democratic institutions existed already facing a huge amount of threat. We have had, of course, parliamentarians being jailed, uh, you know, prominent opposition politicians uh, being uh, disqualified or being jailed. So there's this sense that uh, the Republican system we talked about is under a considerable attack. So could you maybe also take us through what has been the trajectory of that and, you know, what is happening in that aspect? Yeah, sure. Um, so I, I already mentioned a bit about the political system uh, and the power and dilemma of Erdogan before. Uh, so uh, I want to explain more about the capitalist class in Turkey because it's in close relation to the uh, this class. Uh, it's the capitalist class, uh, to put a finer uh, point on it, a few big family. Uh, I can name it, Koch and Sabancı families and some others, uh, and their organization in Turkey. Uh, uh, we call it Tursiyat, uh, basically the uh, patrons uh, club, uh, you can name it. Uh, they supported the presidential system. Uh, they had this dream about Turkey. Uh, only two parties and a president. Uh, this was their dream. So. I think you you too very familiar with this type of political system. Uh, we can see it it's first in England uh, and also in United States, uh, but in some other countries too. Uh, this makes a perfect condition uh, to eliminate people's true choices. Right. Uh, their true parties as well as revolutionary parties like ours. And they created this parliamentary wall. Uh, in terms of vote, vote rate, uh, it's seven right now in Turkey, uh, but back then it was ten, uh, and dictate other parties, so-called small parties, to don't interrupt us and even don't bother to join the uh, elections. So they first see this need in sixties in Turkey, uh, between sixties and seventies. Uh, the Turkish working class people and growing left struggle created their own deputies uh, and made them struggle uh, in the parliament. Uh, there were deputies of working class, actually. They were socialists. Um, and capitalist class, uh, capitalists fear these policies, uh, consequences. Uh, they used military coup. They changed the system. Uh, finally, uh, they changed changed the system to the two alliance version of it, like the United States, uh, Republicans and uh, you know Democrats. And uh, present president uh, was the highway of this system, as it were, uh, because parliament was slow, uh, but president would be faster. Right. In order to privatize the economy, ban the strikes, uh, pass the contracts, and pass the boss friendly acts. So it's true that uh, Erdogan benefited from the system's weak points and make himself as an administrator or one man, uh, as it were, uh, because world was world was changing. Uh, Turkey uh, Turkey was in a state of a prolonged chaos. Uh, and there was no exciting alternative to the Erdogan. Uh, but every time he used this system's weak points, we see that uh, he himself gave opportunities to the big bosses as a political ammunition, uh, but also as a gigantic profit of the corporates. Uh, and at the end of the day, uh, we should say that it is the bosses the capitalists in Turkey who benefited most this political system uh, as they always wanted to be. Right. right. That's, that's very interesting because uh, it connects to my next question also because in many parts of the world you see that uh, the right wing, in this case the Islamist forces and the capitalists having a very interesting relation. So in that connection I wanted to ask you about the Islamist project that you mentioned in the beginning, in the first question. Uh, how has that project progressed in, as in what is the aim of that project, so to speak? You talked about how the AKP and Erdogan are basically 
considered a moderate Islamist force. But how have they sort of uh, tried to intervene socially to bring about changes to sort of support their political agenda? Um, yeah, the image was uh, moderate, but the real is uh, dif different. Yeah, the real right. was uh, different. Um, basically, AKP at the beginning of the 2000s uh, formed as a project party in Turkey. So I use the term project in both means. Uh, as a Turkey's own difficulties, but also the, as a regional uh, Middle East, uh, Mediterranean, Mediterranean, as a part of imperial intervention. So it was a coalition of cliques and powers uh, in AKP. There was Gulenists, uh, it was a regional sect in Turkey. It's a close relation, in cl close relation with the CIA. And there was liberals, there was extremists, etc. Uh, they are backed by United States and European Union. Uh, the AKP's agenda uh, was simple, basically. The first, they needed to transform the state practices to change the society uh, in order to implement their agenda. Uh, and the region as well, the second one. Uh, they were coalition, but their agenda wasn't far from the clear. They wanted to speed up the counter-revolution radically in Turkey uh, against the Turkey's founding values, uh, we call it. Uh, they wanted to demolish republicanism and laicism uh, in Turkey. They also needed to change the foreign policy of Turkey. Uh -huh. uh, in order to interfere in the neighbor countries uh, and to uh, to help American and European imperialism. You know, in Yugoslavia and Syria and Iraq, uh, there are lots of it. And they couldn't do that without changing, changing the images and uh, symbols, even memories in people's heads. Uh, so their counter-revolution flared up. Uh, education system, healthcare system, Every part of the state apparatus transformed and filled with religious sects uh, in Turkey. Uh, they seek to build a society uh, run by religious codes uh, without laicism. Uh, they seek to build a society in which exploited majority cannot struggle for their rights, but only comply with. Uh, of course, it won't be like Afghanistan or other countries. Uh, but here we are, uh, Turkish way of it, uh, I can say. Uh, Turkish way suitable for Turkish capitalism. Right. Uh, I mentioned about transformation uh, and the, what blocked this uh, transformation in Turkey at the beginning, the first question of yours. But I must say that uh, they failed a lot of points uh, on those years. However, they transform society in a considerable degree. Uh, we accept that. Uh, it's the main opposition party, uh, CHP, uh, the synonym. And their alliance is responsible for this mess. Uh, because I stated earlier, every time Erdogan and AKP stuck at the wall, hit the wall, uh, and receive a warning from the people of Turkey, in June days or in Syria, uh, it was the opposition rescued Erdogan, uh, acting like a bilingual mediator, as mm -hmm. it were. Uh, that's the basic. This uh, actually brings me very, it's a good segue to the next question as well, which is really that, uh, of course, the election has been, you know, in the media portrayed as a contest between Erdogan, uh, the AKP and the CHP. Uh, but like you, I think, said at various points, there is often sometimes you feel that there is no real or difference on many issues between the two, especially on the issue of economy, uh, you know, whether on the issue of foreign policy there's going to be any difference is a big question. Often it may, they may not be. And, uh, you know, so it seems that the opposition's main argument is that they are not Erdogan. 
right so in other there isn't there's not real real understanding of what their alternative agenda is so from the perspective of the turkish communist party from from a left perspective so to speak what do you how do you see how turkey can be sort of uh, say let's say taken back or saved in this situation yeah uh, as you said uh, and i summarized the opposition's point of view uh, they are the same they have same economic agenda uh, i can share our view, our view briefly our party's alternative uh, we have three main principle or elements of our economic and social agenda uh, we say we will nationalize or state statize uh, every strategic industry and corporation including food monopolies healthcare and education uh, we say that only planned and statist economy can guarantee people's welfare uh, and event even their life uh, as we can see in the uh, massive earthquake uh, in recent months um, we say we will shut and end the activities of religious sects mm -hmm. uh, there is no merit system in education or healthcare nor a people state uh, until laicism restored and established that's why we will shut and end the activities of religious sects um, mm -hmm. lastly we say we will uh, we get out of NATO. Hmm. Uh, so NATO is a terrorist organization uh, and we are part of NATO. Uh, our soldiers serving abroad as part of NATO operations that will be recalled. Uh, American base in our country will be closed. The nuclear weapons in Injirlik, the city of Adana, uh, the southern city in Turkey, uh, will be dismantled. There will be no cooperation with those who have accounts in their country's territories. Uh, the anti-imperialism and patriotism require this, uh, I must say. Absolutely. And finally, maybe could you just take us through what the TKP's uh, election campaign has been about? How is the party approaching the elections? Yeah, oh, I can uh, summarize briefly. Uh, we think that Communism has solid roots in this country, Turkey. The past 30 years, but especially the recent years, uh, for example, uh, the earthquake, uh, but uh, we see before that, uh, the recent years proved our faults and plans. So uh, this political system, regardless of who is going to win this election, uh, will suffer from chaos. Mm -hmm. uh, we can already now see that the next parliament will be full of sex, rivalries, and more. Uh, so we need to gain strength and prove that the Turkey, as well as our people, of course, uh, if we can do that, we can do, do more between two elections because we have one more election uh, for the localities. Right. Uh, because there will be austerity policy, in Turkey after the election, there will be political and legitimacy crisis. Uh, there will be a need to fight and consolidate against what is coming. Uh, so when we look at history, uh, we see that uh, Turkish people gain strength and energy to the struggle only when they do the job by themselves. In streets, in squares, in factories, in neighborhoods, in schools, in universities, uh, so we planned and created our election campaign uh, according to these principles. Uh, our deputies are the deputies of struggle, deputies of uh, their factories, their neighborhoods, their schools, their universities. Uh, we reach people, try to hold their hands, invite to a real struggle in our campaign. We want people's votes for our principles and our program and want them for to strengthen their ability to, to fight for. We think if we can do that, uh, we will show and prove more of this, uh, both in the streets 
but also in the parliament. Uh, but not uh, by different alien powers, by our own power uh, and by our own organized power of the people. Well, thank you so much for talking to us, for giving us, I think, uh, an understanding of Turkish politics that goes beyond just the slogans that come out during the elections and goes into a much more deeper analysis of uh, capitalism itself, his role. Thank you so much for talking to us. And that's all we have time for today. We'll be covering the Turkish election closely, bringing you the results as well. So until then, keep reading and watching People's Dispatch.